Hi, everyone. Great to see all of you. I know we've got people still joining in, but I'm going to start the introduction. Welcome to the 10th Ulrich virtual program that accompanies the Ulrich Artists and You Community Billboard Project. I'm Leslie Brothers, director of the Ulrich Museum of Art, and I'm here with Jana Irwin, our head of education. We have a very special program planned for you this evening, presenting historian and photographer, John Edwin Mason. Dr. Mason will be speaking about the unique relationship Gordon Parks had with Muhammad Ali. The billboard featuring Parks' portraits of Ali is located at 5218 East 21st. I hope that all of you have had a chance to see the 20 billboards currently on view around the city. And time's running out. So if you can fit it into your holiday plans, please go to the website, check out the map, put the locations together and do the tour. It's so worth it. All of the artworks that are featured in the project are identified and described on the portal page on the website and information on the Smartify app and Jed Bodwin's curated playlists on Spotify are intended to enhance your viewing and your listening experience. We thank our individual sponsors also listed on the website and our lead sponsors, Mike and Dee Michaelis and Emprise Bank. We also thank the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission, which awarded us funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, and many thanks to Humanities Kansas for their support of the project. If you are not a member of the Ulrich Museum of Art, please consider it. It's free and it's a great way to stay connected to us, especially in a time when plans change rather quickly. Just go to our wonderful website, find the join give dropdown and fill out the very short form. We'd, we'd love to have you. It's now my pleasure to introduce John Edwin Mason, who teaches African history and the history of photography in the Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia. He co-directs the university's Halsinger Portrait Project a multimedia initiative which explores the neglected history of Black Virginians through studio portraits of them that were made a century ago. His work in progress, a book about the 20th century African American photographer, writer, and filmmaker Gordon Parks, will be the first extended critical analysis of Parks's crucial Life magazine photo essays on race and poverty. He's published two books, the first on South African history, social death and resurrection, slavery and emancipation in South Africa, and the second entitled One Love Guma Beat, One Love Guma Beat Inside the Cape Town Carnival. Here he brings together history, ethnography, and his own documentary photographs. Working with museums, he organized Gordon Parks' The Making of an Argument at the University of Virginia's Freyland Museum of Art in 2014. And in 2016, he served as senior project advisor for visual justice, the Gordon Parks photography collection at the Ulrich Museum of Art. 
He continues to be an active documentary photographer. He earned his BA from the University of Cincinnati and his PhD from Yale. Please welcome John Edwin Mason. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, it's, really, it's really great to be virtually here with you. I'm really sad that circumstances don't allow me to be in Wichita right now. Um, I really enjoy all of my visits to Wichita. Uh, as you know, and as some of, your, uh, some of the people who are with us know, Wichita is a center for the study of Gordon Parks. Wichita State University in their special collections library has his papers, all of his papers are there. Not his photographs, but his papers are there. And Wichita is also only two hours from Fort Scott, Gordon Parks' birthplace. And there's the Gordon Parks Museum and a lot of people who knew him out there. So um, I really, really enjoy all of my visits to, uh, to Wichita. You know, it's a, it's an obvious speaking about um, the relationship, the friendship, the complicated friendship between Gordon Parks and Muhammad Ali at a time when there's an exhibition um, about exactly that at the Nelson Atkins Museum, which is just up the road in Kansas City. And um, their catalog, which is right here, is just excellent. It's a beautiful, beautiful book with essays that I learned a lot from. So I wanna give a shout out to the Nelson Atkins and a shout out to this catalog. It's, um, it's really a tremendous thing. So I'm gonna launch right in. I'm gonna be talking about this complicated friendship between Gordon Parks and, and um, Muhammad Ali. But first I'm gonna set a timer because I am a college professor and we love to talk. So I'm setting a timer for myself. And this will go off in about a half hour and tell me how much time I have left. So. So here we are, the latest and the truest word, Gordon Parks and Muhammad Ali. They were friends. They were genuine friends. It was a complicated relationship, though. Parks was 30 years older than Muhammad Ali. And that generational difference, it played out in a couple of different ways at least. Parks was quite paternalistic towards Muhammad Ali. He saw Muhammad Ali as a young man who needed to get his life straightened out. And Parks was not above giving him uh, lots of advice about how he should be straightening out his life. The generational difference was also in terms of how to be a black man in a white man's world. Parks had a particular strategy for navigating the white world and he did it immensely successfully. And he did it when very few African-Americans were reaching the heights that he, that he reached. Muhammad Ali had a very different strategy for navigating, navigating race in America. And sometimes those two different kinds of styles clashed. Gordon Parks and Muhammad Ali were also rivals. <laughs> and they were rivals in the representation of Muhammad Ali. I'm going to be using that word representation more than once tonight. Uh, Parks was very concerned with how photography represented Black Americans. And he was concerned that the representation of Black Americans had been, through most of American history, that had been quite racist. Uh, full of stereotypes, full of demeaning stereotypes about Black people. And throughout his career, Parks was determined to change that representation. But Parks was also representing Muhammad Ali. You know, in his photo essays in Life magazine about Ali, he was presenting, representing Muhammad Ali to Life magazine's vast audience. Life magazine had a circulation of millions and it was seen by tens of millions more when people saw it in the doctor's office and they saw it in the barbershop and the beauty parlor, et cetera, and so on. Life magazine had a presence in American culture. And so Gordon Parks was representing Muhammad Ali to life's readership, which was mostly middle-class and mostly white. 
Well, Muhammad Ali had his own ideas about how he wanted to be seen. And I mean, literally seen in photographs, but also figuratively seen, how he wanted to be understood. Um, and so Ali and Parks were fighting about representation. So they were rivals, they were friends, it was a complicated relationship. I'm gonna be talking about two photo essays. The, the, the most important of the two, the most interesting of the two is this one from 1966. Um, uh, it starts with a poem uh, after a few paragraphs of introduction, a poem that Muhammad Ali wrote for Gordon Parks. And here it is, I've taken my title from it. Since I won't let critics seal my fate, they keep hollering I'm full of hate, but they don't really hurt me none because I'm doing good and having fun. Now from Muhammad, you just heard the latest and the truest word. So when they ask you what's the latest, just say, ask Ali, he's still the greatest. It, uh, Ali wrote that for Parks and brought it to him, scribbled on a piece of paper, read it to him in Parks Hotel Room in London in 1966. And of course it's published in that photo essay. I'll also talk about this one. This is the second photo essay that uh, Parks did about Muhammad Ali. This one is less juicy, it's less meaty, it's less deep. Um, but it's still interesting, and it produced a lot of really great photography. You know, when I talk about how Parks was presenting uh, Ali to the American public, he's doing it in two ways. He's doing it visually through the photographs and what the photographs say about the man, but he's also doing it in his words. Now, in the first photo essay, Parks is credited as the writer and the photographer in that photo essay. Here, Somebody in New York in life's offices was working from Gordon Parks' notes, uh, but <laughs> Parks' voice still comes through. If you've read enough Parks, you can hear it, even though he's not credited as the writer of this photo essay. So um, I always like to begin with a word of thanks, and I'm really very delighted that the Ulrich asked me to, to give this talk. Jana Irwin has made it so easy to do. She's handled all the technical side of it. The Gordon Parks Foundation has for the last five years been very supportive of the work that I'm doing, has been very open. They own the photographic archive of, of, um, of Gordon Parks. Uh, Peter Kuhnhart, the director, executive director of the foundation and their staff have been super cooperative, super friendly, and I owe them a lot. Wichita State University Special Collections, boy, <laughs> also, they've got the papers of Gordon Parks, and they've also been, they're just a bunch of great people, and they can't do enough for you when you're doing research there, and I've been really lucky to work with institutions like the Foundation and like Wichita State University. So the occasion for this um, talk that I'm giving tonight are billboards that are all over Wichita right now. And if you're lucky enough to be in Wichita, you can drive around the city and you can see that the Ulrich has put these billboards. They're bringing art to the people. And I think that it's really fantastic that at a time when you know many of us are staying close to home and when many public institutions are closed, um, how do you bring art to people and how do you make it safe? And one of the ways you do it is you put art on billboards. Gordon Parks is not the only artist, not by far, who's on a billboard in Wichita right now. But the occasion is to celebrate this billboard and to talk about Park's photography of Muhammad Ali. So some of you know Gordon Parks. I know that if you are an art lover from Wichita or probably an art lover from the state of Kansas, you know a lot about Gordon Parks. Parks was born in Kansas in 1912, born in Fort Scott. He was born poor. He was born poor. He was born poor and talented and ambitious and gifted with a capacity for a tremendous capacity for hard work. And, um, and, and, and that really propelled him through his life. He had some extremely hard times. Uh, you know, when he talks about his mother, which he does a lot in his various memoirs, he wrote four different memoirs. He gave lots of interviews. He always talks about his mother and she was a remarkable woman. 
you know, I'm here to tell you that I've read about her in the Fort Scott newspaper. It was so unusual for them to talk about the life and celebrate the life of an African-American woman in the 1920s, but they did. Uh, she was really remarkable and she was the glue who held the family together. She died when Gordon, who was the youngest child in the family, uh, was 15. And he went to live with relatives who were then in St. Paul. So he leaves Kansas behind and heads for Minnesota. Minnesota's rough. You know, he gets there just before the beginning of the Great Depression. He comes of age during the Great Depression. Finding a job as a black man is hard enough, but Parks went to live with relatives, but a brother-in-law threw him out of the house, literally threw him out of the house. Parks was homeless for a short spell. He had to support himself from then on. Because he had to work, he never graduated from high school and had a series of menial jobs. This was the depression. But towards the end of the 1930s, he hooks on with the railroad and he works as a railroad, um, a dining car waiter and a dining car porter for the railroad. Not bad work during the depression if you were black there you know the opportunities simply weren't there but one of the things that the railroad did is it gave him opportunity for travel and it introduced him to things that he might not have ever encountered and one of the things he encountered were magazines he fell in love with the fat uh, the photography that he saw in magazines he fell in love with the photojournalism and documentary photography in magazines like life he fell in love with the fashion photography in magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. And he set his sights on becoming a photographer. He went to a pawn shop, bought a camera, and taught himself photography. Now, you know, he had a little bit of mentoring and he also um, uh, studied self-help manuals and that sort of stuff. I mean, he worked very, very hard at it. And he became good with his camera. And the St. Paul Pioneer Press, uh, which was a white newspaper in, in St. Paul, did a story on him, 1940. And as you can see here, he'd only been uh, taking photos for a couple of years and, and he was already notable. And in fact, he was publishing already as a photographer, including in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. He was freelancing for them as a photographer. So they're describing this young man with a dream, an inexpensive camera, determination to portray the American Negro as he really is. This is Gordon Parks, a 28 year old railroad porter, began to prove in 1938 the photography was his medium of, an, of expression. He got very good very fast, but here's a key phrase that I, want to cl that I want to highlight from that article about Gordon Parks, a determination to portray the American Negro as he really is. This is a strong indication that Gordon Parks has already started to inhabit the world of African-American artists and intellectuals. He's part of the debates about the representation of African-Americans in American visual culture. And how, does he, how, does, how did he make those connections? He made those connections in Chicago. You know, working as a railroad dining car waiter and porter, his run took him to Chicago. And in Chicago, he fell in with the crowd at the Southside Community Arts Center. This was a depression era, federally funded um, institution that was to bring arts and arts instruction to the people of Chicago's South Side. There were these art centers all over the United States and Parks fell in with the one in Chicago. He fell in with an amazing group of people who were associated with the Southside Community Arts Center. They sometimes get called Chicago's Black Bohemian Left and just some astonishing folks in there. There's Gwendolyn Brooks. She won the Pulitzer Prize for her poetry in 1950. There's Langston Hughes, the famous poet, Richard Wright, the famous novelist, Horace Caton, the famous sociologist, Nat King Cole, the famous singer, and Charles White, who was a painter. And White became one of Park's best friends. Charles White had been connected to this artistic and political milieu much longer than Parks had. And he had really absorbed the thinking about challenging stereotypes. Another influence and another person who was around the 
Southside Community Arts Center from time to time was Elaine Locke. Um, he taught philosophy at Howard University, but he was also a great African-American arts impresario. And he was talking about what art can do. It can teach us to see ourselves, not as others see us, but as we should be seen. Now, I mean, this is very much, he's talking about us, us African-Americans, not as others see us, not as white people see us, but as we should be seen, finding beauty in ourselves. We can become spiritually stronger, socially and culturally more worthwhile. Charles White, Gordon Park's good friend in Chicago, was much more direct when he was talking about this. He says, in tracing the course of the portrayal of the Negro subject in art, it's a plague of distortion, stereotypes, superficial caricatures, uncles, mammies, pickaninnies. I know if you know the history of American visual art, you can immediately bring this to mind. If you know old Hollywood movies, you can immediately bring this to mind. White was very political, you know, and he talked about using art as a weapon. And this was common uh, among politically engaged, progressive artists in the Depression era, all over the country, not just in the United States. And Parks picked up on this, you know, that he wanted to make art, but he also wanted to make art that had a social impact. Right, and so his chosen, chosen tool was a camera. Now, in other places, he also talks about his typewriter. The Parks was always as much a writer as he was a photographer. And, you know, we, we, he, <laughs> the first great expression of that idea of using art as a tool of social consciousness comes when he goes to the Farm Security Administration documentary project the FSA documentary project. He gets a fellowship uh, from a charitable foundation to go to Washington and he's essentially an intern with this famous project run by a guy called Roy Stryker. And he's in this project that uh, has photographers who have now become famous like Dorothea Lange and Walker Evans, uh, some great American photographers. He's learning from them. He's learning from their images. And he's adding that artistic skill to the kind of political edge that he got in Chicago. And he, this is his first great photograph. Um, and it's probably still to this day, his most famous photograph, his portrait of Ella Watson. She was a housekeeper in the government office building where the FSA was housed. And he approached her and asked her, can I make your portrait? He makes a series of portraits of her over at least two different nights leading up to this one. You know, he starts far away, he gets a little bit closer, they change locations, and finally he sees an American flag hanging in a, in a, in a vacant office. It's after dark, she's working at night. And he says, this is going to make the statement I want to make. This is very clear, it's it's undeniable statement of Ella Watson, who is um, you know, a very capable woman who is working as a charwoman only because of the color of her skin. She has the tools of her trade beside her, but there's the American flag. And this is the promise of American democracy betrayed. This is racism and white supremacy betraying the promise of American democracy. We say that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We say it in 1942, and perhaps today we definitely did not mean it. Parks is on an escalator going up, and it's driven by his ambition, by his talent, and by his willingness to work harder than anybody else. Uh, he leaves the FSA, which, as I said, was already a famous project, heads to New York, and with the uh, stamp of approval of the FSA, he starts freelancing uh, successfully in New York. He starts doing things that, in some ways, are kind of unimaginable in 19... This is a picture from 1944, and it does capture his exuberance and his charisma and his, you know, just his, his also his sense of style. Um, he starts freelancing in the 40s, and by the late 1940s, he's freelancing for uh, magazines like Vogue and like Glamour and like Life. And, and, you know, it's almost inconceivable that a Black man should be freelancing for those magazines. But, you know, he had 
not only his talent going for him, his hard work going for him, coming from the FSA going for him, but he also had um, timing going for him. This is the era of Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson is going to desegregate Major League Baseball, and there are black first, which are starting to appear. In some ways, you could call it the dawn of the civil rights era, that the door that had been closed is just starting to open a bit, and Gordon Parks is there to push it further and further open. So, Parks, freelancing for Life Magazine becomes a job on the staff at Life Magazine for 20 years. He's the only African American on the professional staff at Life Magazine. And he does incredible work. It's really varied work. I'm going to go through this really quickly. This is a single issue from 1952, a single issue from 1952. He does a visualization of Ralph Ellison's great novel, The Invisible Man. It's very creative. He works with Ralph Ellison doing this. But in the same issue, he has a fashion spread. It, it, just imagine a black man on the campus of the City University of New York photographing these young white models. And you think, no, you couldn't do this in 1952. But he did do this in 1952. But he's got a third article in there. He was assigned to photograph Alexander Calder, the great sculptor, and does a wonderful job of that. So he's immensely versatile at life. But the photographs that are the work that really makes him one of the most significant interpreters of African-American life and culture in the second half of the 20th century are the photo essays on race and poverty. I'll say that again, he was one of the most significant interpreters of African-American life and culture in the second half of the 20th century. And I, I put him up there with James Baldwin. That's a big claim, but the power of Park's photography, the strength of his writing, and the vast audience that he commanded from Life Magazine, certainly give him an impact that has not been fully appreciated. So I'm going to go through these photo essays that I think are so important um, very quickly. Harlem gang leader, it's a teenage gang. It's not the kind of gang that has AK-47s. It's a teenage gang. <laughs> Harlem gang leader, segregation in the South in 1956, a poverty in Brazil in 1961. This is also when he starts to write for Life magazine. So Photographer's Diary is when he starts to write. He does a story on the Black Muslims. Um, he also is going to be contributing his own text to this, uh, 1963. This headline gives you a sense of how Life magazine is using him, how it feels to be Black. <laughs> he is, in some ways, their token the word was Negro in those days, their token Negro, their token African American, and he is life's spokesman for African American. And he's going to talk to life's audience, which is always presumed to be white. He's going to tell them how it feels to be Black. He and Malcolm X became very close when he worked on that story about the Black Muslims. And um, became very close, we became friends. Um, and Parks was one of the last people to see Malcolm X alive before Malcolm X was assassinated. And he, this is, the headline is misleading. This is a very generous remembrance of his slain friend. I wanna draw your attention over to the left and to the middle photograph. And there you see Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. Um, Malcolm X was the, one of the most important people who brought Muhammad Ali into the Muslim faith. And that's going to be an issue in later on. Um, Redemption of the champion, it's part of the series. Um, Stokely Carmichael, the black power leader, it's part of the series of photo essays on race and poverty. This is the essay, the text essay, that Parks published after the assassination of Martin Luther King. These are not his photographs. He did not photograph the funeral, but he wrote this essay. It's furious, it's very angry, very, very angry. Um, 
he visited the Black Panthers and did a story about the Black Panthers. That's Eldridge Cleaver and Kathleen Cleaver over there on the right. And the last thing that he did for life was uh, the second story on, on Muhammad Ali. So you probably know that Parks left life. Life was simply his launching pad. Even before he left life, he was writing, published his first novel in 1963. It became a major motion picture that he directed, making him the first African-American to direct a Hollywood studio production. His most famous film is Shaft. It's a good film in the genre. It's, it's, it's still incredibly entertaining. Uh, he wrote many memoirs, A Choice of Weapons. There's that weapon, art, weapon uh, thing again. This was this first, and this is the best of his memoirs. So to understand what Gordon Parks is up to in his representation of Muhammad Ali, let's look for a second at some of the other representations of Muhammad Ali in Life magazine. And this, um, I'm going to pause for a second. I live right next to a railroad track, and you may not be able to hear the locomotive going by right now but it is very, very loud. And as soon as the locomotive gets down the track a little bit, it'll just be the train cars and they don't make nearly as much noise. Okay, so to understand what Parks was up to, you have to look, we have to think a little bit about what life was up to. Life paid a lot of attention to Muhammad Ali. All the media paid a lot of attention to Muhammad Ali. He was not just a great boxer and for a time, the heavyweight champion of the world. He was also a showman and he was a showman by design. This is self-conscious on the part of Ali. You know, Ali was a many layered person, you know, and he had a, many different sides to him. He had different kind of masks that he would put on. And the clown, the showman was one of his masks. One of the ways that he coped with celebrity and fame, and also one of the way that he drew attention to himself and boosted his own career. And the press went along with it. Um, Muhammad Ali the clown, Muhammad Ali the motor mouth, the Louisville lip, he was from Louisville, lip, talker, um, the guy who can't stop talking about himself, <laughs> um, boastful, prideful, clownish Muhammad Ali. That is one of the ways that he was seen. After he defeated Sonny Liston for the heavyweight championship, about that he, everybody thought he would lose. Nobody thought that he had a chance against Sonny Liston. He won the fight. But right after the fight, he announced his conversion to Islam and to the nation of Islam, which in those days was known as the Black Muslims. The black Muslims were an anathema in the eyes of white America. They were feared, they were despised, they were seen as a hateful anti-white group, none of which was really true, but that's how they were viewed. And for the heavyweight champion of the world to convert to this religion was seen as an outrage. So, you know, he is on the one hand, a, a cartoonish man-child, but on the other hand, he has been seduced by the Muslims. And let me draw your attention to the picture over on the right. That's Malcolm X whispering into the ear of Muhammad Ali. Now, this is at an event that celebrated his championship. There are many photographs by the same photographer, Bob Gomel, uh, of this occasion. And many of them are, are very different. They show Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali together looking very serious. In another one, Malcolm X is taking pictures, taking a portrait of, of, of Muhammad Ali, and they're both grinning and they're having fun. But in this one, this looks, this looks subversive. This is, this is somebody, this is sort of a Svengali figure whispering into the ear of the naive ice cream eating man-child. This is how life is positioning um, is positioning Muhammad Ali. And, you know, Parks was the perfect person to do something else. 
Parks had done this story on the black Muslims where part of what he was trying to do was to demythologize the black Muslims, to bring his audience, to bring his white American audience to see this religious sect as what it was, a religious sect, not some evil organization that's out to get them, despite the headline. The, the text is very, very different from the headline, and so are the photographs. And, and here's Park's own essay, What Their Cry, The Black Muslims, What It Means to Me. And so, and he becomes friends with Malcolm X, so he's, he's in a great position here to be the person who then does this story on Muhammad Ali. And here, Parks has his own agenda, and his agenda is to get white Americans to see Muhammad Ali as something other than a cartoonish man-child, a clown, a buffoon, on the one hand, or somebody who has been seduced into this evil cult of the black Muslims, on the other hand. He's going to try to paint a rounder, more complex, more nuanced picture of Muhammad Ali and a more sympathetic picture of Muhammad Ali. Now, Muhammad Ali has his own agenda. Muhammad Ali was very savvy on using the press, on using the press to his own ends, on trying to get the press to represent him the way that he wanted to be seen. And so you can see this tussle um, and it, it, it maybe it even starts with the poem that Ali wrote for what wrote for Parks, figuring that it might get published, but also knowing that this was a way of kind of bringing Parks around to his side. Now, there's going to be a lot of text. There's going to be a lot of text on the screen, and that's because this is a very text-based photo essay. In fact, the photos are much less important than, um, than the text is. It's really in the text where Parks is doing his work of representing, of depicting, of presenting Muhammad Ali to life's readers. And it starts just like this. <laughs> Gordon Parks. And if you've ever heard Ali, Ali speak, you can, you can almost hear him there. He strung out my name for two seconds, flopped across the both twin beds, took a piece of paper out of his hand, and started reading the poem. Um, here's the poem I, I've been promising you. Um, and before I could answer, he was reading. So one of the things that Parks has done here is that he's established the intimacy the closeness that he has with Muhammad Ali and right at the very beginning of the essay that you that he speaks with authenticity because Gordon uh, Muhammad Ali is somebody who can barge in his into his hotel room, call him by a teasing name, flop down on the bed and um, and and uh, read the poem to him. Um, and, and as I was saying, this is very, very, very text-based, you know, there's not a lot of photography. The, the photography is strategic, right? So the first picture that we saw was that full page, big face of Muhammad Ali, and his expression isn't particularly readable. We don't know what he's thinking, but he doesn't look scary. And we're drawn to him, and we're we're sort of we're we're drawn to him. We want to know more about him. It's a, it's a great way of pulling you into this. And here, the second photograph that we see is of Muhammad Ali with a kid. You know, so the headline, or on this page, acknowledges that the American public really didn't like him very much. But we're going to be doing something different in this essay. We're going to be showing him, for instance, with kids. And by the way, kids loved him and he loved kids. This was genuine all of his life. So here's Parks again. Parks, you know, Parks is there to try to figure out who Muhammad Ali is and to then present what he thinks about Ali to the public. So he's talking now about uh, talk, speaking with Ali. I edged toward the subject that was really on my mind. You gave a good, you were good with the press after the fight. 
So Ali had a rep reputation as being goofy, a loudmouth, a clown, self-absorbed, a motor mouth. But, you know, he, he was much more serious after the fight that Parks had just seen. This was in London, by the way. And, um, and so here it is, uh, Ali is saying, yeah, I guess I said all the right things. The loud talk and everything like that is over now. I just want to be myself, a good acting champ. This is the kind of thing that, that Parks wanted to hear. Right, just right, exactly what I wanted to hear him say. The question was, how deep did this go? The situation reminded me of the final moments I had spent with my son, David, before he went off to the army. He actually went off to Vietnam, David did. Muhammad and David resemble each other, not only physically, but in the way they walk and gesture. Only this time I didn't offer any advice. I wanted to, here's this paternal thing. He's 30 years older than Ali, and he doesn't think Ali is leaving, leading his life right. So I didn't offer any advice. I wanted to, I wanted to say, just remember, don't let the reporters rile you. Don't ham it up in front of the cameras. Listen to your trainers. Be careful with your draft situation. You know, tie your shoes, straighten your tie, buckle up your pants. Uh, it's, it's very, it's very, 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 very fatherly. And, um, you know, we don't have Ali's side of the story, but, you know, Ali genuinely liked Parks and probably thought it was pretty amusing. Um, so more text, more talking. Uh, Parks is talking about their relationship. There's a lot of dialogue in here. There's a lot of his interactions with Muhammad Ali. And so, you know, he's writing from the vantage point of London, but he's saying that I had met Muhammad Ali when he was training for the fight in Miami. And here he's telling the readers what they already know. His public image was in tatters. He was accused in the press of sins ranging from talking too much to outright anti-white bigotry. Absolutely. We forget how hated Muhammad Ali was when he first won the title. Rumblings of dislike for him ever since he became a Muslim. Well, there had been rumblings of dislike long before he became a Muslim, that becoming a Muslim accentuated them after the fight in 1964. And then last winter, he said, I don't have no quarrel with those Viet Congs. What he was saying was that I'm not gonna go to Vietnam. I'm not gonna go to Vietnam. I am going to refuse the draft. You know, the war in Vietnam was still popular when he said that in 1967, um, or 1966 when he said it. Um, he said it in 1966. In 1966, Martin Luther King had not even come out against the war yet. He knew that coming out against the war would lose him so much favor, he didn't do that until the next year. The war was still popular. And so when Ali said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into the service. That really was almost a death knell for the way that people thought about, white people thought about him in the United States. And I have to say, not just white people. So, but Parks began to feel a certain sympathy for him. There was a side to this brash, poesy, spouting kid, kid, <laughs> calling him a kid. Uh, Ali was 24. Uh, brash, poesy poetry spouting kid that I admired. I was not proud of him as I had been proud of Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was an earlier heavyweight champion in the World War II era. Joe Lewis had been so different from Muhammad Ali. He was quiet. He was deferential. You know, he was somebody who went out of his way to make white people feel comfortable around him. Ali didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. And so Parks is saying that, you know, it's uh, Joe Lewis is the kind of heavyweight champion I want, not Muhammad Ali. It's a generational thing. I wanted Muhammad Ali to be a hero, but he wasn't making it. I also felt that he could not possibly be as bad as he was made out to be in the press. And so Parks is going to be showing us that um, he's not as bad. And they talk person to person without any put on. Um, he felt I, he trusted me and I felt free to tell him directly. I'd come to see whether he was really as obnoxious 
as people were making him out to be. Now, Parks is going to hold us in suspense, but you can imagine what the outcome is. He's going to say that, no, Ali is not as obnoxious as he's held out to be. More text. Um, and the headline refers to his, his conversion to Islam, which, as I said, was um, a real, um, like a third rail to uh, most white Americans. So he talks about his, um, his conversion. He says, well, when he was winding up his training in, Ali, uh, in Miami, came across him, his hands lifted facing east, mumbling, interesting use of the word, mumbling prayers to Allah. But I never witnessed the hate that he was said to have. I did see him standing in the burning sun for an hour, signing autographs for Southern children. You know, that Parks is talking to his audience in a way that gets them to trust him. I mean, they, they're a little suspicious of Islam. So maybe when you pray, you use a word like mumbling, but he's also telling them that this business about him hating white people, no, it's not right at all. You know, let me tell you what I've seen. And he tells, gives more, a little few more examples than just signing autographs for white children. Still more text. I, I was telling you, there's just so much text to this photo essay. Um, but, you know, it's uh, just before he left. And by this, he means leaving, leaving Miami. He's going to be going to London with Ali and his entourage. I took the chance to tell him it's not only white people, but a lot of Negroes don't like the way you act. That's true. That's really true. It makes me think of my father. My father was born um, two years after Gordon Parks, so they were men of the same generation. My father didn't like Muhammad Ali either. He didn't like the fact that he was so loud. He didn't like the fact that he was so brash. He didn't like his bragging. Um, my father liked Joe Lewis more than he liked um, Muhammad Ali. So, you know, I think there is truth, a lot of truth to what Parks is saying here, but a lot of it is, is about, um, about generation and about how do you live as a black person in America. But still, that cut him deep, he erupted. What do they want? I ain't promoting alcohol, sex, et cetera, and so on. So what if I am the first black athlete to stand up and say what I feel? He wasn't the first, but he was close to it. You know, America was not used to black athletes, famous black athletes who were not deferential, who did not go out of their way to make white people feel comfortable. They weren't used to that, you know? And so Ali is saying, I'm gonna be me. And what more do they want? This is Parks, still belligerent, still the mistreated kid in a hostile world. And yet I reflected that he made some sense. He made some sense in terms of, this is Parks talking about how he wants to keep his dignity, his self-respect intact. He wants to be himself. Making sense, Parks is also referring to what Ali was saying about the Vietnam War and refusing the draft. Still more text, it goes on and on and on, but we're wrapping it up. So we're in London now and, and Park says that Muhammad Ali had been listening to me and he had heard me say that you're really going to need to change the way that you behave. And Ali had taken it to heart. And so he appears in Gordon Park's hotel room again, this, and says, here's what I'm gonna say, read it and tell me what you think. Here's what I'm gonna say at the news conference. Here's what I'm gonna say to the press. It was a note scribbled in red ink. This is Ali. When I was campaigning for the championship, I said things and did things not becoming of a champion, but I'm a champion now. And today I'm measuring my deeds. I'm measuring my thoughts. By the help of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, this is the new Muhammad Ali. You know, he's not renouncing the, the nation of Islam in any way, shape, or form, but he is saying that I'm going to be more serious, I'm going to be more dignified, and in some ways I'm going to be more like Joe Lewis. So this is Parks, minutes later dressed in a 
black silk lounge suit, Muhammad Ali, sparkled with confidence and charm. So, you know, we're ending this photo essay, and now Ali sparkles. He's got confidence, he's got charm as he faced the battery of microphones and reporters. By now I was sure that what he would say came from an impulsive, well-intentioned heart. But I wasn't listening as he spoke. I stood in the back of the room, wondering if the new resolve would last, if the new Muhammad Ali would last. And how, here's how he closes. And he, and he just might do it, I decided. For, at least, he seemed fully aware of the kind of behavior that brings respect. Already a brilliant fighter, there was hope that he might become a champion everybody could look up to. So, you know, here's, here's Parks, and he's brought his readers along, and he's, he's positioning now Muhammad Ali. He's not who you thought he was. He's going to change. He's going to be dignified. He's going to be respectable. He's going to be the kind of person that you are going to come to admire. I don't know how much Parks believed this, you know, that he was doing what he wanted to do was to change the public's attitude towards Muhammad Ali. And maybe he did buy this. And, and I'm sure that in some ways, Muhammad Ali believed it too. But, you know, the, the goofy clowning side of Muhammad Ali was never going to go away. That was part of his charisma. You know, and the, the part of Muhammad Ali that had earned him um, earned him the, uh, the, 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 the hatred of so many people, that wasn't going to go away. I mean, what changed was less Muhammad Ali than the American public changed. Well, okay, so where's Parks coming from? And I think one of the places Parks is coming from, he's coming from Duke Ellington. He's coming from admiring Duke Ellington. He's coming from admiring the way that Duke Ellington got over, the way that he negotiated the, the difficult, treacherous waters of race in America. This is obviously a Gordon Parks photograph of Duke Ellington, but here's what he wrote about Duke Ellington. Unlike other black Hollywood stereotypes, he never grinned, he never smiled, he never shuffled. He's, oh, sorry, let me start all over again. Unlike other Black Hollywood stereotypes, he never grinned, he smiled. He never shuffled, he strode. It was always good evening, ladies and gentlemen, never how y'all doing. At his performances, we young Blacks sat high in our seats, wanting whites to see us, knowing that this handsome, elegant, sharply dressed man playing that beautiful, sophisticated music was one of us. Two things going on here. First of all, he's describing Ellington in a way that Ellington is everything Muhammad Ali was not, right? He never grinned, he smiled. He never shuffled, he strode. It was always good evening, ladies and gentlemen, never how y'all doing. Um, so, you know, just in terms of what he admires in style, it's that elegant, sharply dressed, sophisticated sort of way of being. So that's the first thing, you know, that, that Parks didn't write this, did not write this as an explicit contrast with Muhammad Ali, but it's an implicit one. But the other thing is that Parks was describing himself. When he described Ellington, he's describing himself. Now, this is Albert Murray, the um, African-American essayist and novelist and all around intellectual who knew Parks, knew him well. I've taken this from, in fact, a very hostile review of one of Parks' memoirs. It's a hostile review, but here's Albert Murray describing Parks. He has the kind of personal style, cosmopolitan taste, beautiful manners, charming wit, sophisticated connections that not even the most exclusive schools catering to the richest and most ambitious families can guarantee. You know, so here's Albert Murray describing Parks in language that's so similar to the way that Parks described Ellington. And this is how Parks got over. You know, this was Parks' strategy for negotiating, as I was saying, the treacherous waters of race in America. That wasn't the only Gordon Parks. You know, 
<laughs> Richard Roundtree starred in Shaft. And so that's a picture of Richard Roundtree over there on the left. I got to interview Richard Roundtree a few years ago. And, and um, this was Richard Roundtree's first movie. It was not his first starring role. It was his first movie. And yet in his first movie, he carries the weight of this movie on his shoulders and he does it with a bomb. And I wanted to know, how did you manage to pull off being the star in your very first movie? And he said, I just did what Gordon Parks told me to do because John Shaft was Gordon Parks. You know, that's a side of himself that Parks repressed most of the time. Very few people saw that side of Gordon Parks. He writes about that side in his memoirs, you know, but once he became a staff member at Life Magazine, you, you didn't see this, you know, and that ability to repress that side of himself was something that I think he wanted Muhammad Ali to do. Okay, I'm gonna wrap things up. This photo essay is less interesting. The photographs are really great, but it covers a lot of very familiar territory. You know, it's, it's if, if the first photo essay was about Muhammad Ali reinventing himself, this is also Muhammad Ali reinventing himself. No more boasting, right? And so I'm going to skip over this one. And, 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 and you know, you can admire the photographs. The photographs are great. Um, but I, I need to end. And so I'm going to end here. So this is, um, this is a photograph by Frank Sinatra. And this is a... Um, a photograph of the fight where Muhammad Ali uh, lost to Joe Frazier. It was his attempt to make a comeback and to win back the heavyweight championship that had been stripped from him. And Frazier beat him to death. Um, he was very, very badly beaten and injured in this fight. Gordon Parks was there. And Parks was supposed to be making photographs, but he didn't. And he said, why? And this is a great place to end. So this is an editor's note at the beginning of that issue of Life magazine. They had a lot of photographers there, including Frank Sinatra. We did not get one set of photographs we had been expecting. Gordon Parks, who had been a good friend of Muhammad Ali for years, explains why. Mine was the only camera allowed in Ali's dressing room after his defeat. He seemed helpless like a kid who has tumbled off his bicycle. There he was, wordless at last, suffering through, the, suffering through inner pain, greater inner pain than a swollen jaw, a situation so many critics had been waiting so long to describe. Now the opportunity was mine, but suddenly my friendship with him outdistanced my journalistic chores. I couldn't bring myself to release the shutter. So, um, thank you, thank you for sitting through all of that. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, John. And we have a few questions, yeah. um, if you don't I, mind. I don't I'll mind at all. Share I'm just, them with you. I'm sorry I spoke so long, but um, you know, once you get me wound up talking about Gordon Parks, I just can't stop. Well, John, I don't think anyone here is sorry. Yeah. So thank, thank you so much. And I also want to say hello to David Parks and thank joining us. Oh, David's, this evening. David's here. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, let me give a pitch for David Parks. Um, his memoir of his time um, as a soldier in Vietnam is a fantastic book. It's an incredibly moving book, and it's um, you can find it. It it's, was republished a few years ago. The earlier edition is still available um, in used bookstores or online. Uh, just, just search for David Parks, Vietnam. It'll come up, and uh, yeah, uh, it's a fantastic work. Fantastic. So 
Thank you for that. And uh, I'd like to share from Terence Cribs Laurent. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mason, for your willingness to keep this legend alive through his brilliant works. What I would like to know is if you were able to interview Richard Fontenelle from Gordon Park's Life 1968, The Cry That Will Be Heard, or from Kenneth Gordon Fontenelle. Yeah. Um, yeah, I first wrote about the, um, the Fontenelle family and Gordon Park's essay, uh, A Harlem Family, uh, a few years ago. And I started working on it and uh, went looking for Richard Fontenelle and found out that he had passed away just weeks before. Um, it, it, the story of the Fontenelle family is, is, is a tragic one. And um, I regret that I didn't ever get to meet Richard Fontenelle. Uh, Richard was the child of the family who made good. Uh, he had a job and He's a maintenance supervisor at Columbia University. He had a recording studio in his house, wife and kids. Uh, he was living, frankly, he was living the American dream and died of a heart attack at a cruelly young age. Um, so no, I haven't met him. Uh, I hope to meet um, other members of the family, but that's, that's not on my schedule at the moment. Okay, I have um, from, from David Parks to panelists and attendees. Um, I don't know if I've got this right. From Wil Wilma Moore Black of Wichita, Kansas, publicist for David Parks. Great to see you, Dr. Mason, and welcome to WSU's virtual programs. Question one, what was the most unique about the relationship or friendship between Gordon Parks and Muhammad Ali. Uh, number two, tell me about the meaning behind the reference to Gordon Parks as the Renaissance man. And number three, in your research, have you encountered examples of how personalities or, or egos clashed between Gordon and Muhammad Cash? Yeah, well, the relationship was, as I said, really complicated. You know, there was a genuine friendship, and you can see that friendship in the poem that I opened up with. Um, you can see that friendship in the scene um, that I closed with, the scene in Muhammad Ali's dressing room after he had been really beaten up by Joe Frazier and had lost the fight. And, you know, his jaw was swollen. He could barely see out of his eyes. He was flat on his back. And Parks didn't make the picture, right? You know, there was friendship and affection between the two, but there was this generational divide. And, you know, just like you don't get along with your father, um, I think there were things about Gordon Parks that made Muhammad Ali roll his eyes. And there were things about Muhammad Ali that obviously made Gordon Parks roll his eyes. But, you know, they got past that. They got past that. And I've been thinking about Park's relationship with Muhammad Ali and with Malcolm X. And I was saying that Richard Roundtree told me that John Shaft was Gordon Parks. And I said that Park asked that most of the time. But I don't think he repressed it around African-Americans and especially not African-Americans who were working class, people who had been on the streets. And Malcolm X had certainly been on the streets. And Gordon Reeds. They had a lot in common. And I think that that John Shaft side of Gordon Parks is one of the things that made his relationship with Malcolm X possible. You know, both of them had straightened up and fly right, you know, that Malcolm X had, you know, a very rough early adulthood, he spent time in jail. Gordon Parks had brushes with the law. They had changed, but they had that background. And, um, and I think that background allowed him to 
bridge whatever divided him between Malcolm X, what the bridge the divide between himself and Malcolm X, but also with Muhammad Ali, um, that that he was somebody who could be just as was somebody who was very poor and very marginalized or was a representative of those poor and marginalized communities, he was just as comfortable with them because he had been there as he was with the country club set or as he was in the offices of Life magazine. You know, Parks was a multi-layered man and that allowed him to move in a variety of different kinds of circles and, uh, and produce the kind of art that he did. A uh, Renaissance man, yeah, for sure. You know, he's a poet, novelist, filmmaker, essayist, memoirist, photographer, um, composer, musician, pianist. Um, I think of all the things that he did, uh, he did photography the best. Um, I think 100 years from now, when people think about Gordon Parks, they're going to be thinking about these photo essays on, on poverty and race, and they're going to be thinking about the profound impact that he had on the way that mid 20th century white Americans saw race. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say see, I mean that literally, how they saw race, but also in the metaphorical sense, how they understood race. You know, that, as I said, you know, an hour ago, that. Um, his impact on American culture has not been fully appreciated. And one of the things I wanna do in this book is to make that argument and to, uh, to show that impact that he had. John, I just wanna share a couple things. Um, Larry Schwarm, is, uh, responding to the end of your talk, he writes, the last point sounds like the civilizing for which we now have less or little patience. What do you think of this point about Gordon's instinct to lighten the of Ali? I'm not sure exactly what he means. I mean, um, if he's talking about that moment where Parks decides not to make the picture, you know, I think that I know that <laughs> um, that was an unusual decision when Parks made it. When Parks made that decision in, what was that, 1971? When Parks made that decision in 1971, I think most working photojournalists would have made the picture. And most photojournalists would have made the picture whether or not they were friends with the person that they were making a picture of. I think his lot has changed in 50 years in the photographic profession, especially among the younger generation of, of photographers. Photojournalists, documentary photographers now think much more about the people that they're photographing. They see it much more in terms of collaboration. They are aware of the potential for photojournalism and documentary photography to exploit the people who are in the picture. And I think that many, many, many working photojournalists today would not make that picture of Muhammad Ali bruised and battered and vulnerable. I have just a few comments here uh, from Lee Starkle. So interesting and delightful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Uh, for Lane Bernstorff, thank you for the great tour you gave to my honors creativity students a few years ago when you were in Wichita. I'll be using the recording of this presentation in my future classes. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> we went through the exhibition at the Ulrich. It was great. Yeah. She had a great class. Smart kids. Barbara wants to thank you for a wonderful lecture, for sharing your research and insights. And um, yes, I just want to, oh, let's see, I'm sorry. From Lizzie McDonald, one more. Um, how to apply Gordon Park's photography and other works to today's problems? 
I don't know if you can. Um, I don't know if that's their job. Um, parks photography can help orient us towards the world that we live in by telling us where we came from. And I think that's really important. Uh, you can't know where you're going. You can't imagine where you want to go unless you know where you came from. And what Parks photo essays, what his photography can do is that it can illuminate the past for us. You know, it can show us the origins. Well, it can show us the deeper roots. Let me put it that way. The deeper roots of the problems that we confront right now. It can show how some of what we are confronting right now is very, very similar to the way things were when Parks was working. You know, it Parks' work provides us a foundation, you know, upon which we can imagine our own future. Thanks, John.